In January 1934, as Hitler's shadow began to fall across Europe, a short, bald man carrying a German passport arrived at the Hotel Euler in Basel. He seemed haunted and restless, as though he urgently needed to be elsewhere. Fritz Haber, Nobel laureate in chemistry, confidant of Albert Einstein and German war hero, had arrived in Basel a broken man. And, three days later, he died, leaving an uncertain legacy. For some, the great German chemist was a benefactor of humanity, winner of a Nobel Prize for inventing a way to nourish farmers' fields with nitrogen captured from the air. For others, he was a war criminal who personally supervised the unleashing of chlorine clouds against British, French and Canadian troops in World War I. Tragedy marked his life. A week after the first gas attack in 1915, Harbour's wife took his pistol and shot herself. And in 1933, when Hitler came to power, the Jew Harbour was among the first of the scientists driven out of Germany. Within a year, Harbour was dead denied honour both in his homeland and abroad. No life reveals the moral paradox of science, its capacity to both create and destroy, more clearly than Fritz Haber's. Between genius and genocide is a story filled with ambition, patriotism, hubris and tragedy, set amidst huge technological advances, arms races, mounting imperialism, and war. He was an extravagant, impetuous and occasionally pompous man. His conversations disregarded all limits of topic or time. He loved an audience and worked out his ideas by talking aloud. But when his audience left, the internal fires subsided. In private, Harbour struggled with doubts and insecurities. He was often anxious, sometimes depressed, and always restless. Lise Meitner, the co-discoverer of nuclear fission and an equally keen observer of human nature, was struck by the contrast between Harbour and another prominent member of Berlin's scientific establishment, Adolf von Harnack. Harnack, she wrote, possessed an inner stability that made him seem remote and detached. Harbour was quite the opposite, divided within himself and extremely passionate, which as you can imagine, sometimes made things difficult for himself and for others. His spontaneous reactions could be very violent and not always objective, but in the long run his generosity and reason always triumphed. Science alone wasn't enough for Harbour, he needed to do, change and create. He moved confidently between laboratory, factory and battlefield. And wherever he went, his antennae responded to the desires of those around him. Like a boat's taut sail filled with wind, Harbour absorbed the energy of his times and converted it into motion. In any recounting of Fritz Harbour's life, the Holocaust stands in the shadows just out of sight. We know what's coming but Fritz Haber doesn't. With our gift of hindsight, many of Fritz Haber's passions and choices, especially his devotion to Germany, seem foolish and short-sighted. One aspect of his work seems downright macabre. During the years immediately following World War I, Haber oversaw the research that led to the insecticide called Zyklon, then its successor, Zyklon B. A decade after his death, the SS ordered tons of that poison for the gas chambers of Auschwitz and Treblinka. Among those who died in those gas chambers were Harbour's own relatives. 
Despite all that, it's worth repeating the obvious. During the years when Fritz Haber climbed toward fame and fortune, the Holocaust was still unimaginable and it was not inevitable. Haber's Germany was a nation with the same potential for good and evil as any other, unburdened by any particular load of guilt. He lived in an era of globalisation, imperial rivalries and breathtaking technological change. His life takes place, in other words, within surroundings that look surprisingly familiar to a 21st century reader. And the moral choices that he confronted during his life were not so different from those that we face today. Harbour lived the life of a modern Faust, willing to serve any master who could further his passion for knowledge and progress. He was not an evil man, his defining traits, loyalty, intelligence, generosity, industry and creativity are as prized today as they were during his lifetime. His goals were conventional ones, to solve problems, prosper and serve his country. And this is what makes his story tragic, for those goals, however familiar and defensible, led down twisting paths toward destruction.